Hi everyone, thanks for joining this Your Overseas Home webinar. My name's Rosie, I'm a senior copywriter at Your Overseas Home. Today we'll be chatting with Alex Ingram from Chase Buchanan about your financial and tax considerations needed for a move to Italy. It's great to have you with us today, whether you're watching live or on demand. Um, today um, I'll invite Alex to share his presentation, then we'll open the floor up to questions. Um, if you have any questions if, as we go along, feel free to pop them in the question box. It's just on the right hand side of your screen. Um, we do hope to answer all your queries today, but if we don't get around to them, don't worry. Um, Alex and the team at Chase Buchanan um, will be available um, and you'll have their information just afterwards. So Alex, um, I understand you're calling from Florence today. I'm already insanely jealous. <laughs> Um, it'd be great if you could just start by giving us a quick introduction to yourself and Chase Buchanan before we get into your presentation. Yeah, absolutely. So Chase Buchanan is a wealth management com company that specializes in helping um, expats that are moving to Southern Europe. So we operate primarily in Portugal, Spain, France, Italy, and Malta and Cyprus. Um, we have offices in most of those countries. And we can really help you understand uh, essentially the financial and tax essentials of planning for your move and when you live in country. Okay, great. And how long have you been with Chase Buchanan? I have been with them for about 18 months now. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll skip through your slides for you if you just want to kick off. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, I've worked in wealth management for over 10 years. You can hear from my accent that I'm American. Uh, I've lived and worked in both the UK and Europe, been based in Italy for the last five years, and I have lived and worked in six different countries. So I have done the kind of very similar moves to what you guys are, are kind of hopefully looking to do. Uh, I have purchased and owned and rented property in Italy as well. So I, I come from a, a place of experience when talking about some of the property stuff, if any property tax questions arise, which inevitably they do. Um, if we just keep going. Yeah. So Italy, the tax year and tax residency, Italy is actually quite specific and peculiar in how they deem you to be tax resident. So the first thing to know, the tax year in Italy is different than the UK. It's 1st of January to 31st of December, like much of Europe and the US. Um, there are some local and regional taxes as well as national taxes. So if you're living in Tuscany, you'll have small regional taxes to deal with. If you live in the city of Florence, you'll have some small Florence taxes to deal with. But by and large, what we're talking about here are national taxes. So, or federal taxes, we might think of them. So you're deemed a tax resident in Italy, not based on physical presence. And this is the biggest misconception with Italy and what makes it different than other countries. You are deemed tax resident if you are in the anagrafe, which is a list of people that are resident in the, in the local community. So if you are in the anagraph at your local commune, which is like your council, for more than 183 days in the year. So if you get put into the list now, today, the 4th of May, you are tax resident for 2023, whether you are physically present, present in Italy or not. So there are also some other secondary criteria. So if your permanent abodes in Italy or if your center of economic or family interests are in Italy. So where that comes into play is if, you know, for example, a spouse and children live in Italy, you run a business in Italy, but you try to say that you're tax resident in Monaco, that's not really going to work. And that, that has happened to a few people where they've got caught out on it. Um, so that is the basis of tax residency in Italy. So your fiscal obligations as an Italian tax resident include income tax on worldwide earnings. So it's not just specifically what you earn in Italy when you are tax resident. It's everything that you earn worldwide. Social security tax, which is can be quite burdensome. Um, Americans have a slightly different treatment because they have a different social security agreement with Italy than the rest of the world, essentially. Um, capital gains taxes, wealth taxes, which aren't as burdensome as they sound. And then you have to declare your overseas assets to the Agencia dell'Entrata, to the tax agency in Italy. There's also a fairly minimal inheritance tax and fairly minimal property taxes in Italy. So we go to the next. 
oops, sorry, we skipped one. So the income tax and social security contributions, like I said, payable on worldwide income, social security is applicable on earned income for those people that are still working. And the contribution rates differ whether they're employed or self-employed. So it's about 26.23% if you're self-employed up to a maximum income limit. So if you make, you know, a few hundred thousand euros a year, not all of your income is going to be taxed for social security as well. But the reason that I bring it up is a lot of the headline rates and the things that we'll talk about as far as um, tax schemes and and uh, tax holidays, essentially, in Italy, social security doesn't always uh, isn't always included in those. So it's just important to point out that you may have a social security liability if you work in Italy. So the income tax rates are fairly high by international standards and they go up quite quickly. So over 50 grand, you're into the 43% tax rate. The interesting thing about Italy is the government is actively working to make taxation more fair and they are actively working to lower tax rates. So it's probably one of the countries in Europe that's most proactive at the moment as far as the tax regimes and as far as not just for people moving to Italy, but for local Italians, they're actually trying to create a fair tax system, which isn't true of every single country throughout Europe. Um, there's, there's a lot of discussion going on in the Italian parliament about how to achieve this. So capital gains and wealth taxes are important when you have a large asset base or any kind of asset base and you're looking to move to Italy. The capital gains tax you have to think of almost as a financial tax too, because it works a little bit differently than it might work in the US or the UK. It's a 26% flat tax. It's applicable to capital gains, to dividends, and to interest income. Interest income is not ordinary income in Italy. It forms part of financial income. So that's an important piece to point out. There's a wealth tax on foreign property and that's equal to 0.76% per annum of the original per purchase price, that can be offset with foreign property taxes in a lot of instances. So in almost every U.S. state, you can offset your um, wealth tax liability on your property and your obligation to Italy. In the U.K., it's not as straightforward, right? Because if you have a tenant and the tenant pays the council tax, then you can't use that as an offset. If you pay council tax, then you can use that as an offset. But honestly, it's not quite the same um, because it's based on purchase price and not on some of the council tax values that are that are really quite low across parts of the UK. Um, there is a wealth tax on foreign investment accounts of 0.2% of the account value. That includes personal pensions like SIPs. Um, and what's important to point out about that is that this is not meant to be discriminatory in any way towards holding money outside of Italy. You pay that same tax if the money is held inside of Italy in an investment account. It's just automatically taken. So when it's automatically taken and you know locally you don't know about it, it feels a little bit different than when you write a check to pay for it. Um, and then there's a wealth tax on bank accounts, which is just a flat 34 euros per year per account. So now we're going to go to some of the kind of really interesting tax regimes that exist in Italy, because Italy, like I said, is trying to fashion itself as an attractive tax jurisdiction. And they're working really hard to do this. And one of the things that's really key to, to what they're trying to achieve in Italy is that they're trying to very specifically target certain types of uh, new residents that they would like to arrive in Italy. So one is that they're looking for kind of retired people to move to Southern Italy to help repopulate some of the parts of Southern Italy that have become a little bit deserted in the past 20 or 30 years. They're looking for working age pop people and they're looking for high net worth wealthy people like most countries are, right? But the 7% flat tax regime in Southern Italy is really one of the best tax regimes throughout Europe. So you are eligible if you are a new resident to Italy with a foreign pension. Your eligibility depends on moving to a commune in Southern Italy 
with less than 20,000 residents. So when we're thinking Southern Italy, think of anything south of Rome. Now, it doesn't include Lazio, but let's see if I can list off the regions. It includes Campania, Calabria, Basilicata, Puglia, Molise, Abruzzo, uh, Sardinia, and Sicily. Okay, so it includes the islands and most of southern Italy, and there are some little exceptions here and there. It lasts up to 10 years, and it's a 7% flat tax that's applied to most of your sources of income. So it's 7% on capital gains, pension distributions, so taking any money out of a SIP, for example, dividends, any foreign income, essentially, so things like rental income. Um, and you don't have to disclose foreign assets or pay any wealth tax. So those, those wealth taxes that we just talked about on property or potentially on a SIP, they do not apply when you're on the 7% flat tax regime. Now, it may sound a little bit restrictive, a commune in southern Italy with less than 20,000 residents. To be honest, a lot of those like postcard images that you see of beautiful towns on beaches in southern Italy actually qualify. So there's a lot of extremely beautiful, really attractive places that qualify. Um, so it's definitely worth looking up the, the areas that do. I just have a quick question on that. Um, if, say, you move to one of these places, are you? do you have to apply for this or yeah. is it automatic? You do, okay. And I think the really important part of the flat tax regime is that you have to, when you immigrate to Italy, mm -hmm. you need to put yourself into an anagraph, so that list, at one of the local councils. To be eligible for this regime, in the first instance, the first council that you're registered with has to be a qualifying council. Okay. So that's the really key part of this is it has to be a qualifying council for in the first instance. You can't move to Milan and then say you want to move to southern Italy um, or else a lot of people would be doing that. But that's that's kind of one of the, the real keys is the immigration and the tax planning have to move in lockstep for this regime. So it's yeah. a great question. Yeah, it's a good one to consider then. So definitely yeah. move to the small town that you do the research for first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so then the impatriati regime is for people that are that are still working or have some kind of employment income. And impatriati is it means kind of like impatriate in English. So you get either a 70% or 90% deduction of your taxable income, depending on where you settle in Italy for the first five years. So the 90% applies to those southern regions that we just mentioned. And no, you don't have to live in a small town. So any commune, any council that you register with in the southern regions, you get a 90% deduction of your taxable income. <laughs> Excuse me, in the rest of Italy, it's a 70% reduction. Then for another five years, you can be eligible for a 50% deduction following that if you have children or if you purchase a property. And I believe if you have three children, you can qualify for a 70% deduction. So there are um, options to extend it. And for a lot of people that are looking to purchase a property when they move, they might automatically qualify for the extension. So you can't have been tax resident in Italy in either of the two previous tax years to be eligible for this. But this is one of the key things that's attracting people to Italy. I have heard anecdotal stories about people that are actually looking for their first job in Italy rather than in London to get the tax break on their taxable income. So it's, it's quite an interesting regime. Again, this does not apply to Social Security. This is the big one where you still have to pay social security if you're american again it's different and this it makes this regime even more attractive and then you've got the hundred thousand euro flat tax regime so this is a common regime across europe italy has it too it's a flat tax of a hundred thousand euros that acts as a substitute for all of your other tax liabilities the regime lasts for 15 years it doesn't cover any income generated in italy so the assets really remain outside of Italy. That's the key to it. It can be extended to other family members for an additional 25 grand. And it's actually applicable in more circumstances than are immediately obvious. So 
we've had many people come through that have been advised either to apply for this or not apply for this. And it is a fairly nuanced calculation because it depends entirely on your asset base. Mm -hmm. You don't have to pay wealth tax when you, when you have this as well. This covers your wealth tax liability. It's a substitute for all of the other liabilities. So that's why it's kind of essential to do a, a nuanced calculation with this one. Um, interestingly, this was brought in at the same time that the UK closed their resident non-DOM regime, tax regime, or when they were looking to close it. So it's just kind of an example of Italy trying to be competitive uh, in this department. Is this type of tax um, on the individual or is it household? This is on the individual. So, it, you know, for a husband and wife, you mm -hmm. would think you pay 125. Um, and, and it's all about structuring, right? So it's about structuring before you move for not only this one, but for the 7% for the impatriati. It's about understanding what your tax liability is going to be before you move and what your asset base and income sources are. So inheritance tax, this is actually a, one where Italy is considered an inheritance tax haven. So it's based on your relationship to the deceased. It's 4% of the estate value for spouses and children with a 1 million euro exemption for each beneficiary. It's 6% of the estate value for siblings and close relatives with a hundred grand exemption for each beneficiary. So if you are leaving, you know, your estate to your spouse and children, there are very generous um, inheritance tax rules in Italy. And it makes sense primarily because wealth is passed down generationally in Italy. That is a major part of the culture is that you buy a property and you expect to leave it to your children. Uh, a lot of our Italian friends here, they buy a property with the idea in mind that they will leave it to their child who's like only seven years old at the time. So, you know, it's a, it's a huge part of forward planning in Italian culture and it's actually a very generous mentality and mindset. Um, there is a property transfer tax to pay. It's minimal, it's about 3% of the cadastral value. The cadastral value is essentially the same thing that they use to uh, look at council tax in the UK. So it's that kind of depressed historical value that they might take from 1991 instead of 2023. Um, there are planning opportunities to lower inheritance tax payable, but you can see that it's usually not at the forefront of your tax or financial planning in Italy. And then Italian wills. Um, Italy operates a forced airship system like much of Europe. What that means is that the state essentially defines who you can pass portions of your wealth to. What it's, it's, a, it's called, it's part of what's called the Napoleonic Code throughout Europe. These are civil law systems instead of common law. And really what it's trying to do is pr protect your blood relative heirs so that, you know, only a portion of your will can be distributed to someone who is not in your direct bloodline, essentially. And that also includes siblings and it also includes parents. So it's, um, you know, you can create a will that is uh, certainly different than what the forced airship system dictates, but it's important to include a clause that states that you want your estate to be distributed under the laws of your country at birth if that's applicable to you. And it's a directive known as Brussels four throughout the EU. And that works whether you're, whether you're British, whether you're American, um, it's just a, a, a piece of estate planning that that's typically pretty worthwhile. This is based on Italian assets. So, <clears throat> excuse me, something like an Italian property or Italian bank accounts. Would that be, um, so what you said about beneficiaries, um, yeah. only a portion can be passed to your designated beneficiaries. Would that be the same in the case that if you um, were unmarried, you had a partner, but you're not married? So if you had said the majority goes to them, would it still apply here? That's where you've got to be careful. I think you can, there's, there's probably a time limit on common law. So what's considered a common law marriage within Italy rather than uh, a full on civil marriage. Um, 
but marriage is also different in Italy than it is in the UK. So I got married in London and I get asked pretty much every five seconds what marriage regime I got married under. And it's just, oh, I just say, got married under the English one. So you can have a common property or a separate property regime in Italy. Okay. And so it really d does depend on whether you own the property together or whether the property is treated as separate within okay. the marriage regime that you elected at the time that you got married. And there may be different planning reasons to elect different things. It may be a second or third marriage. It, it may be um, to protect different parts of your estate. So it's a more complex question, um, but that is, you know, that it does happen. I have heard yeah. stories where- Yeah, something you know, to consider if you're in unmarried, yeah. And that's where, again, you know, it, sometimes when you're in a second or third relationship, the children in Italian law can supersede a spouse or a partner, um, you know, when it comes to inheritance. So it's important to plan for that and recognize that. And just some general pitfalls to avoid. So a lot of UK tax-free savings products like ISAs and NSNI products like premium bonds, they're taxable in Italy. Those things are very specific and bespoke to the UK. Um, the sale of UK property could attract Italian capital gains tax. I think that's an important to recognize that some planning needs to be done around that. Your tax-free lump sum on a UK pension is taxable in Italy. That is only tax-free generally in the UK. Italy doesn't recognize trusts. Um, a lot of it, actually this trust law thing is changing as time goes on. How they recognize trusts is certainly different than how the UK would recognize trusts and certainly how the US does. So it's important to, when you have trust planning, a lot of them are transparent. It, it offers very little protection. Um, and UK domicile mutual funds and ETFs can be considered non-harmonized in Italy and gains can be taxed at income tax rates. That is buried within the tax code in Italy. So it's not always well recognized, but it's something to, plan for and be cognizant of, especially within ISAs, right? Because an ISA offers no protection within Italy. So just a checklist if you're thinking about moving. Uh, speak to a regulated financial advisor before you make the move to Italy. Um, UK IFAs, if they're not registered within the EU, they're no longer able to offer advice. Uh, you need to understand your savings and investment structures and UK pensions so that you know that your, your options and that's something we help people kind of plan around. Um, and if you intend to sell your main residence in the UK, you need to complete the transaction before you become Italian tax resident. So there's a lot that goes into a move. I think that's uh, relatively clear. Um, Italy is actually a, a nice jurisdiction as far as being able to get answers from tax professionals. Um, there are a lot of good tax professionals that are used to dealing with non-Italians or returning Italians. And I think that can be really helpful. Um, but yeah, it's, it's good to take advice when you're looking at a move to Italy. Those are just my contact details. Um, happy to go through some questions. Yeah, of course. Um, we've got quite a few. Let me just minimize this so everyone can see you. Um, okay, so Edwin asks, do income taxes apply to those who spend only three to four months in the country per year? It, it, again, it's not about physical presence. It's about where you are actually registered in the anagraph, in the list. So this is Italy is one of the, the countries where, you know, physical presence is not, is not actually a determining factor. Um, Colin's asking, do retired people qualify for the impatriati regime? No, so that, that forms a different type of income. The impatriati regime is for earned income, um, not for passive income. Okay. Um, Julia is asking, um, do deductions all apply if someone was to purchase an apartment in the southern area of Italy with the 7% tax regime? and then within the same year purchases house in Tuscany? So what happens is, you, you, so you've got to be registered in a commune, right? So when you are registered in the commune, it's about where you maintain your residence in Italy. So if you purchased the house in Tuscany as a holiday home and maintained your residence in Southern Italy, then yes, you still get the deductions. 
if you move your residency in the same year to the house in Tuscany, then no, it doesn't qualify for the 7% flat tax regime. Okay, that's good to know. Um, Regina's asking if there are no blood relatives and a person includes the Brussels four clause, electing distribution to charities or friends in the USA, will that be okay? <clears throat> yeah, so, I mean, that's kind of the intention of the Brussels four. And again, I'm not in a state lawyer or a will writer within mm -hmm. Italy, but um, yeah, that's the, that is the purpose of the Brussels four election. Um, and I have clients that do that um, mm -hmm. in the US that are in Regina. We've, we've spoken before. So hi, Regina. <laughs> um, our next question is from Alison. She's a European citizen, um, married to a UK citizen. Um, she's buying a property with her own money. Will Italian law see this as jointly owned with her husband or will it respect that she's 100% the owner? Um, so you need to, again, it just depends on the contract. Uh, Italian mm -hmm. purchase contracts are a little bit different than other countries, I would say. They're actually really flexible and they're they're quite they're quite bespoke to the to the purchaser. So I think it, it just depends on how you align the contract, right? So it doesn't matter if it's your money, if it's your husband's money. Um, that actually has a lot more to do with tax implications of where your tax resident. It's who's really on the deed in Italy, right? And how you guys got married. Again, it goes back to that how did you guys get married? And um, that's how Italy views it, essentially. Lovely. And I think we've got just one more question. Um, if you're married after purchasing a property, how do you get your spouse in the line of inheritance? Yeah, again, so it's just uh, that that Brussels for election or creating the will. Um, I think that's the real key. Lovely. Uh, well, thank you, Alex. It's been really great talking to you today. Um, some really insightful tips and advice there. Um, everyone listening, we do strongly recommend that you get in touch with Chase Buchanan directly. Um, there you'll be able to talk about your personal requirements in detail. Um, you'll be able to speak to them um, using uh, Alex's contact details or um, in the email that we'll send you with that information. Um, so thanks again, Alex, and it's great to see you all here again. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Well, good night.